Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. The tragic failed pregnancies of Bloody Mary I. Throughout the Tudor period, the question of who would be the successor or the next in line to the throne was a prominent thought in the mind of every king or queen. Henry VIII became obsessed with the idea of having a son that would become his heir, to the point where his marriages suffered because of it. It was his third wife, Jane Seymour, who finally gave the infamous Tudor king what he wanted in the form of Edward VI, but this wasn't before Henry had his second wife, Anne Boleyn, executed inside the Tower of London. But Henry's eldest child was Mary, Princess Mary that later became Mary I. She also was determined to have a successor, and a child that would continue her line on the throne, but this is something she did not secure. Because of this, her half-sister Elizabeth became the successor and she became Elizabeth I, one of the greatest queens that England has ever seen. But what is the story of Mary I's failed pregnancies? On the 19th of July 1553, Mary Tudor was declared the Queen of England. She had just deposed the Protestant nine-day queen, Lady Jane Grey, after the Privy Council switched their support from Jane to Mary. Following her seizure of the throne, she knew that she needed an heir, and especially needed one to help continue Catholic's rule in England, at the expense of Protestantism. Mary knew that if she did not produce an heir, then her sister Elizabeth would return the country to Protestantism, and for Mary to unite England and Rome again, following her father's split, she saw this as a suitable way of building an alliance which was previously broken. It was on the 25th of July 1554 that Mary and her husband, Prince Philip of Spain, the future Philip II, were married, and by this time things were looking bleak for a successor. Her biological clock was running out of time, and at the time of her marriage Mary was 38 years old. It was not impossible for a Tudor woman to conceive a child at this time, but it wasn't easy. Mary must have known that time wasn't as favourable as it could have been, and she would have prayed to God every day and night for an heir, and in particular a son. She was so strong in her faith that she believed bringing England back to Catholicism would grant her the wish that she wanted. Around September of 1554, Mary believed that she was pregnant for the first time. However, determining pregnancy was difficult during the 16th century, as they did not have simple tests which would show the results. Doctors were unable to tell the difference between false pregnancy and a real one, and it's documented that around this time doctors genuinely believed that Mary was with child. The only way to see if pregnancy was real in this period was Mary actually delivering a child. Mary claimed that by the end of the month she felt a baby moving in her womb, and with this many believed she was pregnant. The Holy Roman Emperor, her father-in-law Charles V, wrote in a letter reporting the Queen's pregnancy, saying, She is now considered certainly to be with child, and that people in general are pleased with the King and all. Following this, he wrote to his son Philip, Mary's husband, saying, I only wish to say how overjoyed I am to hear the condition of the Queen, my good daughter, and that there is hope that God will give us successors by her. She had no need to excuse herself for not writing in her own hand, for my desire is that she should be careful of her health and take things easily, especially in her present condition. In England, the hopes of an heir were very high, and the news of an heir was important European news, as it would secure an heir to the throne of Spain as well as the throne of England, linking the two countries for centuries to come. But the debate about her pregnancy continued, as it was written on the 6th of November 1554 that There is no doubt that the Queen is with child, for her stomach clearly shows it, and her dress is no longer fit her. Eight days later, it was said, The Queen is in excellent health and three months with child. She is fatter and has a better colour than when she was married, a sign that she is happier, and indeed, she is said to be very happy. Around February 1555, Philip wanted to travel to Spain to talk with his father, and it was said that the Queen was rather down about this, and that these three days, because she had heard the King wish to visit Your Majesty before her confinement, the tradition at this time was that Mary would be needed to go into confinement around six weeks before she gave birth. She thought she would give birth around May, so confinement began around April. 
It was considered wrong for any men other than her husband to attend on the pregnant queen late in her pregnancy, but Mary's doctors began to be concerned about the birth. In private they were not as optimistic, as Mary was older and also she seemed down, and not the most stable in her mental state. Also, her appetite decreased to the point that doctors worried the child would not be receiving the proper nutrition needed to survive. It was said on the 30th of April 1555, There was a similar rejoicing over the birth of royal infants, bells rang, bonfires were lit, and there were celebrations in the street, following news that Mary I had given birth to a healthy son. Rumours were spreading that Mary had given birth to an heir. It was confirmed in the letter by the Spanish ambassador who said, A few days ago there was a rumour that the Queen had given birth to a child, whereupon the people of London and several other places had great rejoicings with bonfires, true evidence of joy. It is said that the same thing happened when the late King Edward was born. However, this was not the case. A Portuguese noble wrote to a secretary of Charles V, confirming the false rumours, saying, Your letters written from Antwerp reached me this morning and told me about the false news that had arrived in the Queen's deliverance. I am writing to Spain with the messenger who is going over land, excusing you for sending the tidings and explaining how it happened. As I have already said, the same false news which circulating here in London. By June, there was still no information about a royal baby, and as July came and went, there was still no baby. Mary pleaded with people that the timings were wrong and that a child would come soon. She then issued a terrifying statement claiming that God would not allow her child to be born until all the Protestant heretics in England had been punished. She did this by executing and burning many Protestants at the stake, making her known to many as Bloody Mary. She ordered many more executions and threw many people in prison. Some of the executions were horrific with people burnt at the stake alongside many others on huge bonfires. But Mary believed she still was pregnant and she continued to cling on to the hope longer than her doctors and many others around her did. To her face people believed her, but in private they thought she was crazy or delusional. In the July it was reported to the Holy Roman Emperor that the Queen's deliverance is delayed and is doubted whether she is really with child, although outward signs are good and she asserts that she is pregnant. Some spiteful pregnancy rumours spread by Protestants even accused the Queen of being pregnant with a pet monkey or a lapdog, and some spread rumours that she had taken another woman's baby and passed it off as her own. Still, into August she continued to believe she was pregnant the 11th month of this false pregnancy, and then she arrived from confinement at last. It was reported, we still have hopes that a child will be born to England. We shall see what God sends us. When she emerged from her confinement, she was very thin, and she felt very embarrassed, and no one dared mention her pregnancy at court. It's believed that Mary suffered from a phantom pregnancy, which is still not the most well-researched topic today. As a child, Mary suffered from a retention of her menstrual fluids and also a condition referred to as strangulation of the womb, and it was said her body swelled to give the appearance of pregnancy and that her breasts enlarged and even had milk. But her maids and even those who tended on her as a child believed she was not pregnant and that she was suffering from a condition. It's likely that Mary suffered from ovarian cancer or some condition that affected her ovaries. Some of the symptoms of this include bloating, abdominal pain or swelling, fatigue, and a number of other symptoms. In her final years, Mary I believed she was with child again, but she was not, as her husband was away when the child was allegedly conceived. With this, it was another phantom pregnancy, and Mary died a rather painful death, but she died without an heir to the Catholic throne. And with this, her half-sister came onto the throne and changed a significant amount of her policies in England. Following Mary's death on the 17th of November 1558, Elizabeth I was declared Queen of England, and she then restored Protestantism to England. In her reign, she battled with the questions of an heir to the throne, but she maintained her reputation as the Virgin Queen and would devote her life to the country she loved. She refused to have a husband, which greatly affected her chances of having an heir, 
but the story of Mary I and her failed pregnancy is a rather tragic one. It's one which would have upset her greatly and has placed great strain on her life and also marriage. She was remembered as Bloody Mary, but much of Mary's life was rather tragic and sad. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.